All right, welcome to another episode of Suturing Time. And today we're going to do our third episode on synchronicity. So what we planned on covering today was um, a couple of videos by a Dr. Kirby Paradise, where he was a guest on the Future Thinkers YouTube channel. And he did two videos. One was called The Science of Synchronicity, and one was called Ayahuasca and Synchronicity. And we decided to film the second part first because we had some concerns about uh, some of the things that uh, he brought up in that podcast. And so we thought it was almost like a public service announcement in a way, just to kind of address our concerns with his with his information. So please, uh, we would re recommend that you watch that video first. Just put it down in the show description and watch that uh, before you watch this. So we're kind of backtracking and we're gonna cover his first video on that uh, YouTube channel now. So um, basically the second video was where he talked about uh, his use of ayahuasca and made some claims that um, we thought were quite dangerous. But in the first video, he talked more broadly about synchronicity. He had written, I guess, a couple of books, I think at this point, but he had written a book on synchronicity and they mostly discussed that. And so we just want you to, to watch the other video first and just kind of keep that in mind. Um, if you watch, you know, our video on covering, covering his discussion, or if you watch, you know, the link to that, to that uh, YouTube program itself, just to kind of forewarn you on what kind of rigor that he does, um, maybe not put into some of the, the, the ideas that he formed. So um, should we get going on that, Phil Dunn? Yeah, that, that, that sounds fine to me. And maybe, um, I'll, maybe I'll start with a little philosophy here. Sure. And I think uh, I'm, I'm an ethical philosopher and I'm, I'm interested in making ethical and meaningful choices. And what, what that means on an existential level is that you choose. Now, I mean, we, 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 could, we, we, could have, we could have just dismissed this thing. We could have just said, well, we could have, we could have made it into a joke, the ayahuasca health claims, and just let it go by because we're just doing this for shits and giggles. But then we would maybe probably actually be in philosophical bad faith because we were, we were saying we didn't have the choice to contest these assertions. You know, he was making quite claims back upon scientific rigor, and yet there was nothing rigorous about the truth claims he was making. Mm -hmm. And so since I'm uh, information professional and Brock has had a background in science and healthcare and is, is a professional, we just sort of decided that we're, we weren't going to let this go because there, there is a, a whole way of taking substances which were used in a unintended way and making unsubstantiated health claims about them. Like they would feel better. It would, there somehow there was something that you would surmise about your change in yourself that you would describe as being good. Mm. So I, I may use this as a window into synchronicity and Carl Jung because, okay, the real paper on synchronicity is only 26 or 27 pages long. And you might say that Carl Jung is to psychology what Adam Smith was to economics. And what I mean by that is there's a very small portion of, of Jung's actual work that deals with synchronicity. He was busy revolutionizing psychotherapy, working with with Freud for a while, and then writing on, on his own later on what they call archetypal images and such. But that 
part of him actually affected my life because at a certain period for 13 years from age 13 to 26, I was a high functioning alcoholic by any definition. That's, that's 51 years ago now, but my certainly, my, my life by any, any measure was that of an alcoholic in terms of consumption and, and what I managed to get through school and some graduate school and work. But as, as I tried not to be an alcoholic, I came upon a book by Burton Ruscha. He's a, he's a, he was a medical reporter and he wrote a book on alcohol talking about its effects and the effects on the alcoholic personality. And he said, well, we, we went to a couple of instances where people who had no hope at all for surviving, their prognosis was they would be dead in a sh short period of time. And since in my own healthcare experience, I was told something like that too, not so long ago. I, I found the survival itself becomes interesting. All Jung could say is these people had something like a religious experience. It was as if there was a hole in their life that they needed to fill with their addictive substance. And that hole in their life was, I can say it no other way, God-shaped. There was an empty space. And when I was a, when I was a young man and trying to make headway with the beautiful girls in the UW-Madison campus by talking about the philosophical suffering of an overweight ex-college heavyweight wrestler, I didn't get along very well at all. But when I said that I drank because I had the salt water blues, which is to say you want something and you're thirsty, so you keep drinking the Kool-Aid until you're dead. And I was knew, knew I was doing that. And then I stumble on this, this writer and the, this philosopher, Carl Jung, who it turned out was a founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, he wasn't the founder, but the people who founded it uh, grounded some of their, their, their program on, on Jung's claim that there was some hope of recovery if there was a spiritual change. And I spent this weekend listening to somebody talk about the early days of Alcoholics Anonymous, the Jungian, Jungian experience, and the fact that what these, these guys did, and they were mostly salesmen and upper class failures. And then in the way they, they would, they, the founders would be like hedge fund managers or something like that. And all, all they were trying to do was one day at a time not get drunk. Mm -hmm. One day at a time not to have to go through that horrible hangover woodpeck. It, it, for an alcoholic, it's like the worst day of your life. Again, I guess it's like a Groundhog Day or something, waking up the same way. And anything that could break that loop, anything that could break that, would lead to you feeling better and that and making that space that that god-shaped hole so to speak filled with something else i mean and the the trick I, i've said this before and i i would say that they were very smart about how they did it they didn't care what you called god all they cared about if it made you not drink then they might try it like a lot of them played played lots and lots of poker. Many of them had whole boxes of Hershey bars, but they weren't getting drunk. And they they weren't trying, they, they, they were aware that they didn't have control of their universe. You know, that the things would happen and sometimes you would just have to walk away about it. And nobody wanted to hear your excuses. Now, as I think about trying to give Dr. Kirby 
what we call a charitable reading. And that's to say, try to take them as he intended you to take them. I found little charity because he, it seemed to me that you were, oh, the, the other part about the, the, the author that I read who wrote this book called Not, Not God, The Early Days of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, he talked about the crisis of the 20th century. His name was Ernie Kurtz. And he said that the problem of the 20th century is we seek a material solution for a spiritual problem. And I found myself watching this guy and watching him and watching him and listening to his tapes. And I said, boy, that face looks like the face of an Irish Catholic priest because I, I could see his whole, him in front of the camera and talking with his friends and, and interviewers. And apparently he was a founder of a therapy movement. And sadly, the, the thing was that I thought, well, gee, I, as I am a clean kind, I would like to meet this guy, the, 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 yeah, Ernie Kurtz, because he made a difference between uh, therapy and going to Alcoholics and Anonymous meetings. But sadly, he died in uh, 2015. So again, I think I, I will ask a few treatment professionals about some of the health claims that Kirby made. But as you can get even on the best of uh, best, best of days, a substance doesn't seem to fill the spiritual hole. No. Mm. Yeah, good point. Yeah, and and I the other part that I think that just on a philosophical level, they were talking about collecting synchronicities as if there was something that you would you would get and you would take it like ayahuasca or something like that it's it, it it's a thing when it's not really a thing what what we try to do is something will happen and it may have happened in my case 60 or 70 years ago and then it's only now when i put it together with something else that i realize there's meaning across time like i had some really great teachers at the university of not wisconsin madison and sometime i'd like to look at the difference between me at 17 and 19 when i'm going from just being another high school jock to a guy who study war studying russian foreign policy with people who later became pretty high level state department people you know so now i'm i'm thinking about i'm getting ready to switch to ukraine i'm going to i'm going to need a couple questions in the break in a while but i i th i think that that i i, I in, in about the last month i've got i've got I've, I've, I've actually gone from disengagement to pretty serious concerns about what's happening with the world. Mm -hmm. And some of my cynicism about Trump, and I know I'm making kind of a jump here, reminds me that in crazy stretched out times, very monstrous, monstrous idea, ideas become a political reality. And then we ask ourselves, well, how did that happen? How did that guy in the gutter, who couldn't get to art, get into art school, end the end up nearly destroying all of European civilization? I don't have the answer, but I think that there should be something like that as part of the curriculum, at least in in, in college, and I think there should be somebody like me that teaches that. I think there's room for us to think about what's going on in the world now and how that relates to things that happened a long time ago. Well, yeah, right. well, no, it's a very, it's very good. It's very good points. And I, and I kind of was thinking, so like 
just to kind of backstep just a bit, is like Phil and I's original intent with watching videos was to kind of take notes as we were watching the videos and then discuss the ideas. But I think what Phil's hitting on here and what just kind of struck me as you were as you were talking, maybe I can just briefly go over some of some of uh, Kirby's ideas on on synchronicity. But I think maybe of more value to, to people might be looking at how he approaches it and kind of what Phil's saying here, how do things kind of go off the rails? And so I'm not discounting his, I'm not discounting at hand or on their face, uh, his ideas, but we had our whole last video kind of laying out, um, you know, some concerns from his second video. Well, it strikes me as, um, because as Phil was talking, basically making references to Hitler, it strikes me that Dr. Surprise, at some point in the video, he talked about theosophy and how he, my, if I, if I remember it correctly, he basically thought that they were right. Um, you know, theosophy had the right idea of trying to collect these, trying to make sense of, of, of these synchronistic events and whatnot. Now, the problem I see, I see with that, um, maybe Phil can go in because I can't remember, I can't remember her name, but, but Hitler um, basically got some of his wacko ideas from this, this. Madame Bl Madame Bl Blavatsky, uh, Blavatsky. Exactly. And she was, she was high up in this theosophy. Um, and um, so it's, it's almost like, you know, Hitler became kind of detached from reality and it's almost like when you look at the way Dr. Surprise presented his ideas on synchronicity, he made, he made it out to be like, you know, in the beginning, he talked a lot about uh, experimental design and uh, talking about, um, you know, necessity for like double blind studies and tried to pre tried to like make it out like there was so much rigor into the stuff that he was studying and, and just so much care taken in um to these experiments and just him you know analyzing the data i'm assuming but then in the second video he goes on to just make conclusions based on a couple of anecdotal reports and faulty logic and so it's almost like um you can make a parallel between kind of maybe how hitler came to certain conclusions taking what he wanted to from, from this Madame Bavatsky or whatever, whatever her name was. Um, and the way that Kirby kind of came to certain conclusions on his use of Iowasa and how they would have anti-aging properties and all kinds of things that could not be substantiated with, with evidence. And there was no like objective data to back it up. And so it's, it's kind of, it's kind of like, I mean, maybe we, maybe we shouldn't uh, cover a lot of this, a lot of his ideas because if he did base them on sound um, principles and, and, and scientific reasoning, well, that quickly went out the window for him when he found something convenient that he wanted to be able to use to further, to further those ideas. And so, so maybe, I mean, maybe we shouldn't, I mean, not to be harsh, but maybe we shouldn't give those ideas the time of day. Not that we're discount, scouting those, I, scouting those concepts in any way, but we can't maybe trust his process of coming to those conclusions and, and coming in, in putting forth his ideas. I don't know. I'll, I'll let you kind of decide that. I mean, I could quickly, we could quickly go through his ideas, but maybe there'd be more value in, 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 in letting Phil with his background kind of discuss any similarities he would see between kind of what's going on here. Um, and given our current Ukraine, Russian crisis, um, because I do think your analogy with, with the Hitler thing where, you know, I mean, the fact that this guy was into this theosophy and that's where Hitler got a lot of these scary ideas and now we're facing another dictator going off the rails. I think maybe there's more value in, in having you kind of discuss any of your thoughts on that. I mean, it's up to you. We can either go through the stuff or we can, like I said, just not give them the time of day and, and, and I, 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 like I think... cautionary tale because, because let's just go back. Cause like, I, I do think there was a, there was a lot of banality to, 
to his conclusions in the second video. Yeah. You know, like he, she just, he kind of made it seem like it was obvious. And, you know, Hitler probably thought some certain things were obvious that were just, so what would I mean, in another world, basically. So, you know, and in another interesting parallel is Dr. Kirby is grinding up these Syrian ayahuasca seeds or roots or whatever he was talking about. Well, I mean, there's a, there's a, I believe it's called Blitz. There's a book that, that uh, Phil and I actually listened to together way back when, but it talks about all the drug use um, in the, in the German army and also among Hitler and, and a lot of these ideas were probably, you know, drug induced madness and hallucinations. So I don't know. Do you want to just talk about that stuff instead, Phil? You think that's a better way to go with this? I, th I, th I think it is yeah. point where we're at right now with, with the war. I think I, 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 I I, I would move for that. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll take one takeaway. Um, because, because I've said that I, I'm sort of evangelically spread ideas. I just do that. And I explain, I, one of the things, takeaways I do now is I talk a little bit to people about LD50. And people are glad to have that information because it, taking too many of a seemingly innocuous substance can have really bad effects. I mean, it's like, who would think a mushroom could kill you, you know? Mm -hmm. And that if you took, if you assumed that the probability of you getting a poisonous mushroom was really, really low, how low, how, how many would you need, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's 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 move to the next part of our show then. Okay. Um, I'm an amateur military historian, and I've got some journal reviews out there, and I have some friends in the field, and I've given papers on it, and I am astounded at what I'm seeing happening with the Soviet Union and Ukraine. I mean, these crazy Ukrainians, a, a comedian, seem willing to fight and die for what they believe. And they have the, the modern army, uh, a 40 mile long traffic jam not being able to walk into, it's not a walkover. Whatever else happens, it's not a, a walkover. Uh, the, the, it's almost like there's historical roles that dictators occupy. And they, they self-validate the, the reasons for taking outrageous and unexpected actions and then when they fail when they fail when they collapse in on top of them they tend to hate the people that they dominate i mean a little known aspect of hitler's last few days is that he wanted to completely destroy every aspect of germany so that the german people would starve to death because they were not worthy of him. Well, I wonder what Putin is asking the Russians to do if he if he makes some ultimate existential move. I mean, who is going to pay the cost for that? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, the, apparently a nuclear power plant is being bombed now. Oh. Yeah, it looked, it looked like it, it looked like it was. Or I don't know if it was directly bombed, but there was a fire started by it, supposedly. And um, now it sounds like the Ukrainians are working at the, the, the workers at the power plant. The Russians have taken control of it and they're working at gunpoint. God. Yeah. And, you know, you would be you would be a. <clears throat> accused of being politically not nice if you said that Russians 
have a tradition. I'm, I'm going to keep keep my language clean for mucking up technology. And now, now we have a Russian army trying to force at gunpoint dissident nationalists to run a nuclear power plant. Would they be just a little subject to sabotage? Might those Ukrainians get so angry that they'd be willing to take out the plant? What would that do to the rest of, of Europe contigu contiguous to the Chernobyl area? Yeah, and see, this isn't in Chernobyl. This is in the, it's in the southern part of it, I believe, and it's the biggest uh, biggest nuclear facility in Europe. I, I had no idea. You know, I didn't know much about Ukraine before this, as far as like nuclear, you know, nuclear uh, energy and whatnot. Yeah. But I guess you know, I was kind of scared when I heard it last night, because um, they had some nuclear engineering experts or whatever, you know, being interviewed, and yeah. apparently, so there's like six of these um, energy producing units, not the nuclear reactors themselves, but basically they have to provide a massive amount of cooling for these nuclear reactors. And they normally run with six of these things online, or at least there's capacity for six. And they were down to one functioning to try to cool these reactors. And like, let's say that thing went out, then basically these nuclear, these nuclear reactors would probably go into a meltdown because you wouldn't be able to cool them. Wow. I mean, I never, did you ever go and in, in, in look at the Tokamak reactor on campus down in Madison? I never actually did, but I had friends who did. And I guess, you know, they use like water and pump all this water and it just turns like a bright blue, like really bright color cooling the reactor. So it's kind of like if you can't move water through and, and cool it, this thing would, could just melt down. No, I, 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 I never, I never, I never did. I'm, I'm thinking about the character, Putin, and as, as I've said, I, I don't want to. I, I want to be analytical in my comments, analytical and critical, and not just name call. But. I saw a Ukrainian video, and they they had they had gotten a meeting between Putin and the president of France, whose name escapes me. Hey, who is the Macron? Macron, and they were sitting at this table that was about forty feet long, with right. Macron at one side and Putin at the other, and that was just the sort of thing. That Hitler would do, where we would see him. We had an appointment with Hitler, say during the good years, before the Munich crisis and before the invasion of Poland. You would have to walk down this really long hall, go through these receiving areas, and it seemed forever and ever to meet Hitler, who was standing above you. You know, his his desk was set up so he could look down at you. Was he but, short too, like Putin? Yeah. Another short man. Yeah, he's he was a short yeah, you're way way shorter than us. And <laughs> and what it what it turns out in one of my Hitler biographies is not only that, not only did they, they do this, but they buffed the floor in such a way that it would be slippery. So the <laughs> day so the diplomats would look undignified if they fell on their ass. <laughs> So you have a bit of homework when you get done. Uh, Charlie Chaplin made this movie based on Benito Mussolini called The Great Dictator. Was he short too? Chaplin, oh yeah. yeah. No, uh, Mussolini? I'm just he, trying, to, well, I'm trying to see if there's a pattern here. Yeah, he was, Scott, he was, he was squat and he was barrel-chested, yeah. Yeah. And very... Very easy to 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 uh, parody, yeah. So we have these short men, and by the way, it turns out I thought I thought Putin was sixty five. He's seventy. Did you know that? 
Yeah, I knew he was right around 70. I didn't know exactly, but yeah, that makes sense. I, I wonder if Zelensky has made any Viagra jokes about him. Well, see, I, I kind of worried, like, I think he kind of looks sickly, and, and, and I'm worried that he has some kind of terminal illness. I would not be surprised to find out, like, he has, you know, I don't know, pancreatic yeah. cancer or, or some, something you can't recover from, and he just wants to kind of leave his mark on history, and so he's kind of going for uh, Hail Mary here, and I'm going to doesn't really care about the outcome. Okay, thank you, Jan. Yeah, so 70, 70 is a big difference, isn't it? Yeah. And, and as my understanding, more and more he's shunned himself from, from critical voices. Now, surprisingly enough, Stalin didn't do that. You know, it, it, at, at, during the first part, during the German invasion of the Soviet Union, which went very well for the Germans for the first couple of months, Stalin was practically in hiding. And when they finally they came and got him drunk, he said, aren't you here to arrest me? And they said, no, you're the premier. And he opportunistically was able to make that transition. Now you can argue about the great human cost that that involved for the Russian people, but somehow there was no nuclear war. I came upon a, 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 a interview with Gorbachev. I, when, when I was trying to prepare, prepare for this show, I suspect I watched a dozen, 13 hours of video because it's all so compelling. You know, I, I did not expect to see this in my lifetime. And here's Gorbachev almost pushing 90. And he talks about what it was like between the time the commun communism fell and there was a new government for the Soviet Union, and which, became, which became Russia, or the Federation Re Re Russian Republic. And he said the Russian people told him, if, if we don't have enough food, we'll make more food. If we don't have enough Factories will make factories. We don't have enough washing machines. We'll do what you want. Just do not get us into a nuclear war. I just looked up out of curiosity here, because um, we got to inject some humor, right, too. But uh -huh. I just looked up, and I think he's just getting up into the safety zone there. I looked him up, and he's five feet, nine inches tall, Gorbachev. So I th <laughs> 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 maybe, maybe that's, the, maybe, you know, like he's safely into the safe zone there. Yeah, well, Khrushchev was a short, stocky man. <laughs> I'm sorry, Phil. Keep going. I didn't mean to like interrupt you. I just no, that, that's okay. <laughs> well, what I I've got one of my papers up. I on feel the like web. I'm Doctor Kirby Paradise here. I'm looking for patterns. Yeah, well, <laughs> it turned out that one of Khrushchev's best friends and meaningful correspondents was Jackie Kennedy. After John F. Kennedy was assassinated, he had the, he was he wasn't much of a writer himself, but he had some one write a beautiful conciliary correspondence with her. What do you think of that? You know, I I I have no no I mean he in in the end Khrushchev blinked and turned the ships around. I don't. I don't know that. I don't know that Putin would do that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's. I don't. Be, I don't know how it's going to play out. Any thoughts? Well, it's going to affect our lives. Well, one one thing. I'm a little. I. I hear a lot of people talking about being ashamed to be American. And I'm not going to take that that route. When I was in Cambridge, England. England yeah, go live in Russia, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I saw <laughs> the United States military cemetery. 40,000 Americans died 
well, I mean, 400,000 died, but 40,000 were buried at that, uh, in, the, in that cemetery. You see the rows and rows and rows of the crosses. Some of my colleagues said, well, why do you want to go there? What, we're against war. Why do you want to go there? I went there, and it showed high relief, like statues, and like engravings. You know, they're, they stand out of young men and then old men and then the war and then, and then an altar. And somehow I'll always remember that because I stepped on the edge of my foot and I fell down and it hurt a lot. And I, I would maybe, and I also read a inscription on a, on a tombstone in a British churchyard of some guy saying, I gave up my today so you could have tomorrow. So I think, I think we need some of that. And if it means gas prices are growing up. Yeah, no, then, absolutely. It's just, um, I don't I mean, know. This kind of goes back. You know what else this kind of ties into, Phil, was our um, um, our discussion on Walter Benjamin. And, oh, let's go. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, the, only, the thing that I'm thinking of is kind of like how he says that, you know, capitalism has to fall to be replaced by communism, basically, you know, in, in the long run. And it's kind of like not wanting to enter a conflict, you know, when you have potential nuclear reactors melting down. Yeah, because you're worried that you may have to pay more at the gas pump. I mean, what does that kind of say about where we're at? Sounds like we well, uh, I you know you know I've been sort of saving this in the back of my mind because George, I always get the Bushes screwed up. Uh, the the younger Bush uh, is that George Walker Bush or yeah, it's W. Well, George W. Bush said, Americans are addicted to oil. And if you think about it, that means that oil is your God. I mean, you, you, you tried to deal with the results of this addiction to oil when you were doing research on, on sand mining and stuff. Mm -hmm. And we would rather turn a, a beautiful wilderness I'm not going to spare into a sinkhole or a slop hole or right. just destroy environmental capital so that we can save a few bucks at the pump. I mean, that, that's the kind of movement, I guess. That, and I, I don't want to say I'm, when this is brought up on as, as a liberal critique, it's often brought, brought up as if to say you can do nothing, you know, that we are, that, that somehow if somebody tells me that all these people are suffering, they're better than I am for telling me. When I want to say, well, there's stuff you don't know. Like after the Russian Revolution, right afterwards, there was a brutal civil war and Russian, the Russians were going to starve to death. And none other than Herbert Hoover went to Calvin, I think it was, Calvin Coolidge and said, we've got to feed these Russians or they're going to be even more dangerous. And so basically, twice we fed the Russians. You know, Putin is not the Russian people. Putin is a guy who, sort of like Saddam Hussein, who ended up in charge in tumultuous times and did what people like that always do, which is to destroy their opposition and, and fill their positions with people like themselves who are more subservient. Well, and I heard, and I, you know, and I don't remember, this was a while ago that I heard this, but I heard that like uh, Putin's biggest fear is that, you know, he kind of had dreams of having happened to him what happened to Gaddafi when they were dragging him through the street and ramming a pipe up his tailpipe. And wow. um, this kind of ties into the synchronicity here, doesn't it? Like, uh, yeah. Well, when you when you when you big up bring up Putin's fears, did you let me tell you? If I interrupt me, 
Mussolini was Hitler's model when he was the Italian fascist dictator. When, when we drove the Italians and the Germans out of, uh, out of North Africa and drove them out of sub, Southern Italy, the Nazis kidnapped him and took him north and made him in charge of a puppet government. But they basically, they basically invaded their allies, the Germans. And right at the end of the war, partisans got a hold of Mussolini and his mister, mistress. They executed him by a machine gun and they hung him upside down in a gas station. And that fate was knowing that that's what Hitler, knowing that that's what he would fate, forced them to fight on and on and on and kill just huge amounts of civilians. I mean, these, these monsters hate their own people, you know. So you, you add these nightmares together and and on a, on a spiritual level, you know, what do we know about the, what they might face the next time around, if there is a next time around? Mm -hmm. Putin's nightmares, yeah. At, at the same time... Putin, what was the book with the pineapple being shoved up somewhere? Oh, that was a movie. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that, that was a movie with Harvey Cattell in it. It is dogma, but yeah, yeah, and, and and it was about conflicts between younger and older demons, and you see this guy portraying as he's being portrayed as Hitler, and part of his his hell as a certain uh, how can I say this? Because I'm going to keep this. Uh, well, uh, it was. <laughs> insert a, a a spiky spiky kind of a, a pineapple being put where the sun don't shine every hour or something yes yes <laughs> thus thus is the faith of fate of all dictators <laughs> yeah it's i don't know it's scary stuff you know when you look when you Actually, what's what's what is strange is that Russia, for all its vastness, has a GDP the size of Texas. We right. have fifteen times their GDP, and I'm just thinking about all the Russians who were planning to retire and finding their money worthless. You know. Well, and see now, I heard a, I heard that um, you know with all these sanctions and their stock market crap taking a crap, yeah. so, supposedly then these people are forced to share sell their shares of these stocks for pennies, literally pennies on the dollar, and then the oligarchs are buying them from them, and basically ending up with more shares of the stocks, even though it's worth worth less, <laughs> because they have the liquidity to buy them up from the people that desperately need to sell those for food or whatnot. So it's actually like uh, paradoxically, it's going to, if somehow Russia comes out of this and their stock market makes any move back, you know, even recovers a third of what it's lost, then these, these oligarchs will have, you know, increased the wealth gap basically. So what you're saying is when and if the world doesn't incinerate, there'll be people in a room in what's left of Moscow saying, well, we won't hire a guy like him again, right? <laughs> right. Make sure he's at least six feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how, how long are we into the show now? Oh, let's see. It's, uh, well, we're about 45 minutes. Why, do you want to end her there for today? Well, I do feel we we did okay. I'm I'm happy with it. Yeah, yeah no, let's uh, we'll sign off there, and then um, we'll we'll decide what we want to cover next week. So, yeah, I'm I'm really I really wanted to get this bookcase behind me. Yeah, and well, let, let I want to let, let's sign off, huh? Should we sign off quick? Yeah, let's sign off. Let's sign off. <laughs>